Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. SHN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. It was two o'clock in the morning on August 3rd, 1975. Jack Molinas was standing in his backyard. His girlfriend and his dog were out there with him. His business partner had been murdered just 10 months earlier under mysterious circumstances. What Molinas did not know on that night was that he only had moments to live. A hitman by the name of Eugene Connor was hiding in the dark behind the neighbor's fence. He had a pistol aimed at Molinas. Connor was using the top of the fence to help keep his hand steady. The girlfriend and the dog were both wounded but survived. Molinas was not so lucky. He was only 43 years old on that fateful night. This is Basketball History 101. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today, we bring you the story of the 1961 college basketball betting scandal. This story is similar to the story we did way back in episode 14 on the City College of New York betting scandal in 1951. And there is a connection between that story in 1951 and today's story in 1961. But each story is a separate betting scandal. During the 1961 scandal, a total of 37 arrests were made involving players from 22 different universities. This was a massive point shaving ring. This was even bigger than the scandal that happened 10 years earlier in 1951 involving 30 players across seven schools. The scandal in 1951 rocked college basketball. It seemed that every game became suspect. When a player committed an odd turnover or missed a free throw, everyone was wondering if the player was doing it on purpose. It took a long time for college basketball to regain the trust of the fans that the games were being played honestly. Every one of those players caught in 1951 was banned by the NBA. A few of them had already begun their NBA careers and were quickly kicked out of the league once they were arrested. The NBA's reputation could not afford to have players in the league known for playing games dishonestly. It would have been a public relations nightmare. The league was not strong enough financially to take such a hit. And now, in 1961, it was all happening again, and this time with more players and universities involved. Again, the NBA banned every player arrested. Even in the 1960s, the NBA's reputation could not afford to take the hit of having dishonest players in the league. Now, if you go back to episode 14, we give a pretty detailed explanation of what point shaving is, which is the thing that is at the heart of the betting scandal, both in 1951 and 1961. But I will give you the short version here to help understand why this is such a big deal. The concept of point shaving is essentially a player or players working to manipulate the score of the game in order to benefit gamblers. For example, the gambler or someone representing the gambler will pay money to the player or players to make sure that the score stays within a certain range. To be specific, they might ask the player to make sure that they win, but that they win by less than 7 or win by less than 10. They typically do not ask the player to lose on purpose because that would look too obvious and raise a lot of suspicion. That is why winning by a small margin is desirable. The player can then claim that they were playing honestly, but just had a bad game or something. So the idea of winning the game by a small margin allows the gambler to place a large bet knowing secretly that the game was being manipulated in his favor. The gambler places his bet for the one team to win by a small predetermined margin. He has already paid the player to make sure that the desired outcome happens. Assuming everything goes according to plan, the gambler stands to make a lot of money from the bet and the player gets paid for his efforts. Of course, in setting this up, the gambler typically approaches the team's leading scorer and sometimes the top two leading scorers because those are the players that have the largest influence on a game. But they do not want too many players to know about it because a secret like this always finds a way of getting out. 
Everything about this is completely illegal. It is illegal for the player to take money to manipulate the game score. It is illegal for the gambler to pay a player to manipulate the score. In the United States, this is a federal level crime, which means that it is the jurisdiction of the FBI, which is essentially national level police. Here are some of the players that were arrested in this particular scandal in 1961. We have Doug Moe from the University of North Carolina. He was a really talented player and because of the NBA ban that came with his arrest, he was completely out of basketball for four years before signing a two-year contract in the Italian League. He then finished his playing career in the ABA who did not care about Moe's past. They just needed quality players who could sell tickets. Doug Moe made the ABA All-Star Game three times during those five years. He really was a top player. He would later go on to be the head coach of the Denver Nuggets, the San Antonio Spurs, and for one season, the Philadelphia 76ers. Second, we have Roger Brown from the University of Dayton. Because of his ban, he played his entire eight-year career in the ABA for the Indiana Pacers, the Utah Stars, and the Memphis Sounds. He made the All-Star Game four times and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2013. He was obviously an incredible talent. Third, we have Connie Hawkins from the University of Iowa. He was arrested but never convicted. But the NBA did not care and banned him just like everybody else. He later admitted to taking $250, but he was a freshman at the time, and back then freshmen were not even allowed to play in the varsity. In other words, he was not even able to play in a game in order to have an impact on it. But he was arrested anyway. He left school because of the scandal and started his playing career in the lowly American Basketball League, or ABL. He then moved on to the ABA for a couple of years with the Pittsburgh Pipers. Then he sued the NBA to be allowed in because he was never tried, let alone convicted, due to a lack of evidence. Essentially, he was innocent of point shaving and felt that the ban was illegal. The court saw it his way and he joined the Phoenix Suns as a 27-year-old rookie and made four NBA All-Star games. He is also in the Hall of Fame, having been inducted in 1992. Now this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back with the story of the ringleader of this entire scandal. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of you unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of the 1961 college betting scandal. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode, this scandal spread across 37 players from 22 different universities. This was the most massive scandal of its kind at university level basketball in the United States. Someone very smart and capable had to be in charge to make sure that all of this worked successfully. That is where Jack Molinas comes in. Molinas was still in his late 20s and was working with another man named Joe Hacken who was a known bookmaker. A bookmaker is the person that accepts the bets of the gamblers. The third person who helped organize this was Vincent the Chin Gigante, who was an enforcer for the Genovese crime family out of New York. Later, Gigante would rise to the top of his family. Molinas was an interesting character. He was from a middle-class Jewish home in the Bronx in New York. He excelled in basketball at Stuyvesant High School, and he was also extremely intelligent. That earned him a scholarship to play his college basketball at Columbia University, one of the Ivy League schools. He played there from 1950 until 1953. He was 6 foot 6 or 198 centimeters, and he was the team's leading scorer and was named captain by his teammates during his senior year. 
It turns out that during the 1951 betting scandal, he was making his own bets on his own team and manipulating the score himself in order to win big on his wagers. He basically figured out how to cut out the middleman and make even more money than the other players who were accepting bribes to manipulate the outcome of basketball games. Back in the 1951 scandal, players were being paid around $1,000 per game to manipulate the score. But Bolinas was working with a local bookmaker directly, making $10,000 per game in exchange for the inside knowledge that he was manipulating the game. That allowed the bookmaker to accept certain bets knowing that the game was going to end in the bookmaker's favor. In one sense, it was genius. He loved the idea of having his own private game within the game. It made things more exciting for him. Playing a game honestly was nowhere near as exciting as when he was busy fixing the outcome for his own financial benefit. And because he was working separately from the organized point shaving ring, he was never caught. He was on nobody's radar. So, he kept doing it for the remaining two years of his college basketball career until he graduated in 1953. Now, he was such a good player that in the 1953 NBA draft, he was taken with the fourth overall pick by the Fort Wayne Pistons. He was so good that he was selected for the NBA All-Star Game as a rookie. Throughout NBA history, there are not that many players who have made the All-Star Game as rookies. Some of those players are guys like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, Isaiah Thomas, Shaquille O'Neal, Grant Hill, and Will Chamberlain. That is some amazing company. That is how good Jack Molinas was as a player. But he just could not stop gambling. Since he was able to make it through three years of manipulating scores in college without getting caught, he figured that he could keep doing the same thing in the NBA. But he was dead wrong. The NBA is filled with much better players, coaches, and referees than in the college ranks. It was obvious when someone was not playing the game honestly. He stuck out like a sore thumb. After just 32 games in the NBA, he was caught and kicked out of the league. I mentioned that he was selected for the All-Star game, but he did not get to play in it because by the time the game rolled around, he had already been banned. The guy had a real problem, which led to his demise. Gambling was an addiction for him. It was also how he made his money once he was kicked out of the NBA. He once secretly drugged a professional boxer to make him listless because he had made a huge bet on the opponent. He even tried using a remote electric shock device to make racehorses go even faster at the end of the race in order to win his bets. He had betting schemes like this going on all over the place. If there was a game to be played and money to be made, he could be found nearby. Here is a crazy detail about Molinas. I mean, maybe not as crazy as drugging a boxer, but in the seven years between his ban from the NBA and the 1961 betting scandal that he organized, he graduated from law school and passed the bar exam and was an attorney in good standing in New York. As 1960 was approaching, he got an idea to return to his roots, so to speak, and organized a college basketball betting scheme. He had contacts with bookmakers and with the mafia to help make sure this whole thing happened. He seemed to have no remorse at all about his activities. When interviewed later about the scandal, he only expressed regret for the bookmakers and the gamblers who also got caught and spent time in prison like he did. He did not care at all for those players who were banned by the NBA. He figured that the players dug their own graves when they accepted those bribes. He said that nobody twisted their arms, so they got what they deserved. The Fort Wayne Pistons paid him $10,000 for his one season in the NBA. In 1953, that was a lot of money. That would be the equivalent of $108,000 in 2022. But at the height of his gambling operation, he and his partners were making $50,000 per week in 1953. He is not exactly the kind of guy that I would want to hang out with. Once he got out of prison for the 1961 scandal, he continued his dishonest ways, but he got himself into deep debt with the Mafia after a few losses. In 1975, he came into a huge windfall of money when he took out a large life insurance policy on his business partner, and then that business partner was mysteriously murdered shortly afterwards. As they say, what goes around comes around. And that takes us back to the beginning of our story where he was standing in the backyard of his Los Angeles home where he was shot and killed. Some think it was in retaliation for his business partner's murder. Some think it was because of the debt he owed to the Mafia. Nobody knows for sure. The tale of Jack Molinas is a sad cautionary tale. He had a gift for playing basketball that very, very few people ever get to have. He was making great money doing it, but he threw it all away to chase illicit financial gains. Sometimes I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that kind of a person. I cannot imagine ever playing a game in any other way than to play it honestly and with 100% effort. But Molinas could not help himself, and in the end, it was probably what cost him his life. Well, that is it for today. Join us next week when we share the story of the elimination of the center jump. Back in the old days, they would have a tip-off after every made basket. 
Next week, we go way back to the early days of basketball. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts, and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There, you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories in the past. Take care and see you soon. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about Really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold. You know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So go (laughs) ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports.